Our next speaker is uh, Lee Mahennett from Intertech Pivot, and he'll be covering the topic of is um, using how to use nitrogen fertilizer successfully. Um, and I guess this is the, the pressure session of today because it's all about if we should be applying that additional fertilizer uh, of nitrogen into our systems and, and how best to do that. So yeah, I'll hand it over to you, Lee, and thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, is my screen up there? Yes, it is. All good. Right. Righto. Um, yeah, so I guess um, in talking about nitrogen, it's, uh, it's become fairly topical in extensive pasture systems um, of recent times. Uh, it's, it's been used as a great tool to, uh, to grow that additional feed at certain times of the year when we run into deficits or to grow extra feed to, um, to store for, um, for fodder. Um, but I guess as uh, Lisa alluded to, and most people will be aware of, there's been um, significant increases in the value or the cost of that nitrogen. And, um, and for people who you know, listen to me talk about fertilizers, um, I tend to view fertilizers as, a, as an investment rather than a cost. Um, a cost is where you, uh, if you use something and it doesn't give you a return, um, whereas an investment, if you use a, a nutrient and, uh, and it gives you a return, then it's obviously an investment. So I guess what I want to just go through is just um, the best management practice for nitrogen, give you some examples of some trials that we've ran um, and, uh, and talk about nitrogen in general and, um, uh, and how hopefully we can get the most out of um, uh, any nitrogen that we put into the system. So Lisa Warren showed the nitrogen cycle, and, and this is um, and this is another example of that. But um, and, and Lisa did a great job on explaining it, so I won't go into any detail. But essentially, urea is our most common form of nitrogen that we use, um, and and that urea is is the, the cheapest um, on a dollar per kilogram of nitrogen. And to say from the outset that. Um, you know, all the work that we've done, Department of Ags have done, CSIRO have done, um, basically indicate that the form of nitrogen or the type of fertilizer that you use doesn't change the response at the end of the day to the grass or the crop that you're getting out on. There's potentially some, um, there's some benefits, uh, potentially from um, logistics and application and management on farm, um, as far as, you know, might be using easy end through a boom spray and, and incorporating in, an insecticide or a produce or something like that. Um, but essentially, the way that a plant sees nitrogen is, um, and, and the way it takes it up, it, it, it will be, um, it, that doesn't distinguish between, between products. So we've got urea within two to, two to four days or one to four days that urea will convert into ammonium nitrogen and, and ammonium nitrogen is quite stable. It'll sit in the soil and, and it can be taken up by the plants. Um, but it goes through this unstable phase where it can convert into ammonia carbonate and be lost to the atmosphere. And so to minimise those losses um, and, and reduce the activity of this urease enzyme in the soil, um, trying to time it or get the conditions right on application make a large influence as to um, whether you can reduce or have these losses, which can be up to 20 or 30% of the nitrogen applied can be volatilised. And in pasture systems, volatilisation is a bigger issue than what it is in cropping, purely because you've got higher organic carbons in the soil and you've got a, a, um, a much more activity of this urease enzyme, which, is, which acts on that, um, which acts, hydrolyzes that urea and, uh, and, and potentially causes those losses. So drying soils, um, light rain events. So if you get a juice in the morning, um, showery conditions, um, rainfall events, less than five or 10 millimetres to actually dissolve and move that urea into the soil and lock it away. Um, open canopy, so you haven't got grass cover um, to actually reduce that wind to drive that gas off. Uh, higher temperatures and higher pH soils and organic matter all lead to um, favorable conditions for uh, volatilization losses. And as I said, they can be as high as 20 or 30%. So moisture is really important to make sure that there's enough putting it out um, within a few days uh, or getting rainfall within a few days of application to, um, to take that nitrogen in. If you've got good grass cover, some ammonium can be reabsorbed back through the leaves of the plant and, um, and, and you'll minimize those losses. But if you've just cut a silage paddock or, um, and, you're, and you're reapplying some nitrogen in that situation, 
on that bare soil in spring, warmer conditions, open canopy, wind, warmth, um, you potentially will get um, significant losses if you don't get that rain. So it goes into the ammonium form, plants can take that up, and then it goes through this nitrification process, which Lisa spoke about. Um, it'll then go into this nitrate form, which is the main form of nitrogen that plants will take up. It's dissolved or it's in the water. Um, so it moves with mass flow as, as the plant takes up water, it'll take up nitrate nitrogen. But in that form of nitrate, in that form of nitrogen as nitrate, it can denitrify and, and losses can be as high as 40%. Um, and most of those losses go off as N2 gases, which is the air that we breathe is about 80% um, dinitrogen gas. So it goes off as that gas, but less than 1% can go off as nitrous oxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, and so we, we, we want to reduce those losses. So again, spring or autumn conditions, where you've got waterlogged soils and you've also got that high organic carbon in the soil will all be factors that will lead to greater denitrification losses. So if you cast your mind back to 2010-11, when we had that big La Nina and really wet springs and summers and floods, um, they were ideal conditions for denitrification. And, and we found coming into that autumn that we actually had um, quite significant um, deficiencies of nitrogen leading into that, uh, that following season. And then you've got leaching. So leaching can be, you know, as low as two kilos of N per year, up to 50 kilos of N per year. Um, and it's dictated to by those lighter soil types. So it's intense rainfall events or high rainfall situations, over irrigation, and potentially the lack of a deep rooted perennial in conjunction uh, in, in your pasture sward, which can actually grab some of that nitrate nitrogen as it moves down the profile. Um, so that's pretty much the end cycle. And it's pretty important to understand um, in that two minute uh, brief summary, uh, plus what Lisa gave, uh, it's, it's important to understand that it is, it is a dynamic nutrient. Um, it doesn't stay in one form for very long. Uh, it's there one moment and gone the next. It can be mobilized into the organic matter. It can be mineralized from that organic carbon. Uh, so there's a number of factors on being taken up by the plant to being lost from the system to being mobilized in the system. So it's important to understand that when we're thinking about our responses um, on applying nitrogen in, in, into a fertilizer, as a fertilizer into, uh, into a pasture system. So it's just some nitrogen rules. So um, we only use it to produce additional dry matter above the normal growth rates. So it's, um, and all, nit all nitrogen does is increase the leaf size. So it gives you dr more dry matter. So a, a, uh, an end deficient leaf will be quite small. Uh, as Lisa said, it could be pale in color. Um, and when you apply nitrogen, it will give you a much bigger leaf area, um, therefore increasing the dry matter. And we, we describe those dry matter responses to applied nitrogen as kilograms of dry matter for every kilogram of N we apply. And we'll talk about those responses because they become very important at urea at you know, 15, 16, 1700 dollars a tonne to make sure that the value we're getting out of that response is, uh, is at the top end and that we're not uh, costing, um, uh, putting a cost into the system rather than, uh, rather than that investment. We only apply it when we, um, when we can consume or can conserve that feed. So again, it, it becomes very costly if we underutilize any of the additional feed that we grow. And what we want to do from a timing perspective is to get nitrogen out pretty much post grazing. So as soon as the animals come out of the paddock, uh, we want to be getting that nitrogen on. So for every day delay that we miss on getting nitrogen onto that paddock, once the stock come out, we reduce um, the potential yield um, by about 1%. And it's always forward thinking with nitrogen. You can't say, oh, I'm out of feed today. I need to go and put some nitrogen on. You've got to think when the feed deficits are going to occur, when, the, when, the, um, when, those, uh, when your stock are going to be calving or lambing and you've got that, um, that high stock demand or when your growth rates slow, have slowed to a point where you're going to have to look at supplementary feeding. So you need to just backtrack and, uh, and look at when that's going to be. And, and you know, during the autumn and the winter and the early spring, it's uh, we try to get to that two to three leaf, or sorry, two and a half to three leaf stage on ryegrass, and somewhere around that three and a half to four leaf stage for phalaris and coxfoot, and that allows the full maturity of the plant during that growth phase to express its uh, its potential as far as how much dry matter you've grown. So it's always working back on how quickly those leaves are emerging um, to how 
how, how um, or when you're going to apply that nitrogen. So in spring, your leaf emergence might be on ryegrass six days, um, seven days. So, you know, canopy closure might be a two leaf. So, you know, you might only be out at a 15 or 20 day rotation, whereas in the middle of winter, um, leaf emergence might be 15 days. So, you know, you, you'd be looking at say a 60 day um, rotation of allowing that nitrogen to show its full potential through the, um, uh, through, through that growth. And, and I'll show you some examples in a second. In a second. The response is variable, um, mineral soil nitrogen, um, mineralization, pasture species and cultivars, grazing management, soil moisture, status of other nutrients, um, day temperature and length are all key components to how much of an end response you get, but um, they're not in isolation. Um, and that, you know, there's many other factors that will, um, will come into play as well. So we'll just cover off a couple of those things. And um, the main con first consideration, I suppose, and one of the main ones is the amount of nitrogen that we need to apply. And in any one application, we want to be applying somewhere between 25 and 60 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. So this is of actual nitrogen. So that works out about 55 kilos of urea up to um, 120 kilos of urea. So 55 up to 120 kilos of urea, if we're talking urea. So anything less than 25 kilos of nitrogen, you tend to find that it, uh, you get inconsistent responses at best, and probably you'll see no response to the nitrogen, purely because there's not enough N going into the system and, uh, and it gets taken up and immobilized quite quickly. Uh, so you don't see any, any responses. So you wanna be putting on at least 25 and, um, and then at the top end, the 60 kilos of N, once you start going over that point, um, you can still get responses, but there's uh, there's this marginal return issue as far as the cost of the additional nitrogen going on to the response you're getting. And I'll show you some response curves just to talk about that in a bit more detail. Soil moisture is, is, a, is absolutely critical and moisture and nitrogen go hand in hand. If you haven't got moisture in the soil, then it's no use putting nitrogen on. And in 2015, um, in a lot of areas, and Western District was a classic case where people went out early in, in July and August, while they still had stored moisture uh, and put nitrogen on, they got really good responses and grew some reasonable spring fodder. If people waited until September, October, and the soil had dried out and tried to get an end response or looked at getting an opportunity to get some nitrogen on, uh, it, in that dry spring, in that dry year, it just didn't occur. So we need at least 50 mil of stored moisture and some of the work that Richard Eckard pulled together, I think they were looking at say 18 trials in the Western District, out of those 18 trials from an autumn application of nitrogen, only three of them gave an end response. And, and that was largely due to the fact that there was not enough moisture on a false break to actually sustain enough pasture growth to give that nitrogen response. And the other thing that, um, the other reason why a lot of those trials didn't give a response was that there was potentially some summer rain and there was a lot of mineralization of nitrogen over that summer. Uh, weeds had kept, been kept under control in an annual situation and, um, and there was enough nitrogen there to actually sustain the pasture growth and putting more nitrogen on didn't give that response. So, um, so yeah, so that, that was another factor. Soil temperature, um, when we talk about those responses, obviously, uh, you know, we will still get pasture growth um, for, for our grasses over five degrees, they slow, um, and therefore the response that we get over winter are tip is typically less. Um, but the value of that feed at those critical times is, um, is different, I suppose, to say a spring, um, a spring value of feed as well. So the responses can be anywhere from, you know, less than five kilos of dry matter for every kilo of N, right up to, you know, we've measured over 30 kilos of dry matter for every kilo of N in the spring. So that's, um, you know, so understanding how much response you're going to get and what the value of that feed is, is really important. Species composition, so grass dominance, having that density in the pasture sward, minimal weeds, really important to, uh, to make sure you get a good response. Plant maturity and reproductive stage. So while the, crop, while the plant, the pasture is vegetative, um, those maximum growth rates will occur and you also get that quality. And then other deficiencies, so making sure that things like phosphorus, potassium and sulfur are in check. And, uh, and applying nitrogen when you've got good base fertility will make sure that you get, uh, get a good response. The other one there is grazing pressure. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second as well, or now as well. So 
as I said, the optimal time is when this is your leaf. So most people would have seen this work from Danny Donahue, but um, the optimal timing is to put nitrogen on as soon as the animal comes out. So you've got a residual leaf there that, um, that's been left from grazing and your first leaf is emerging. Once that first leaf comes out, you've grown about 20% of your dry matter. So you can add you know, half a leaf to that for um, Phalaris and Coxfoot. So one, uh, one quarter, one the third leaf, something like that for Phalaris and Coxfoot. When your second leaf comes out, uh, you grow another 30% of your total dry matter on offer. Uh, and at this stage, the water soluble carbohydrates that are stored in the stem are, used, are being used by the plant to push out those leaves. Once you've got that second leaf out, the water soluble carbohydrates, there's enough photosynthetic material there to start replenishing some of those water soluble carbohydrates. So the plant's um, uh, starting to stack some reserves away. The third leaf comes out, it's maximized its, uh, its dry matter production for that particular rotation. And it, it'd be at four leaf for Phalaris and Coxford. Um, but that last leaf gives you 50% of the dry matter that, that is on offer. Um, and then when the, the fourth leaf comes out, the first leaf dies and your quality starts to decrease. So from a plant health perspective, it's the optimal time to be grazing around that three leaf, two and a half to three leaf. And in spring, you want to be going in around that two leaf stage. And, and it's reflected in, um, in underground as well. If you continually go and graze at one leaf, um, the root system is, is much more compromised compared to if you let, it, let, let the plant get out to that three leaf stage. So grazing management is absolutely critical in, in this whole process. And one of the things with nitrogen, and Cameron Goulet talks about this, is that with nitrogen, you either use it or you lose it. So what, what, what he means by that, and what we've seen in trials as well, is, is if you put out nitrogen at this stage, you've just taken the stock out, you put your nitrogen on, and you come in and graze at two leaf stage, um, you've forgone 50% of that potential dry matter response, you then take the animals back out, you're not going to get the residual nitrogen that has been put into the system come back to grow additional dry matter for that subsequent rotation. So the nitrogen that's put on has to be consumed in that grazing rotation that, that, that they're on there for. If you get that grazing management wrong, you won't get any benefit from that nitrogen you put on. And, and we've put out rates and, and Cameron with his work in the um, Better Fertilizers nitrogen work, uh, put it out rates of 160 kilos of nitrogen. And in the second rotation, in the second grazing, we only saw very small responses up to 160 kilos of N in that second grazing. So, you know, it just doesn't carry forward. It just gets, uh, it gets lost because it's so dynamic. And we saw, you know, how dynamic it is from, um, from that first slide that I put up. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get nitrogen on and we're trying to get the rate of nitrogen on. So we're maximizing um, this, this response. So we wanna be getting it on and, and utilizing it at this steepest part of the curve. Where the curve flattens out is where we're on this tipping over point where the cost of the nitrogen isn't going to give us uh, an economic response to that additional kilo of dry matter that, we're, um, that we've got there. So this is some work that Elliot and Abbott did uh, a while ago in, in South Australia, but it's just good to show, I suppose, a few things. Firstly, less than 25 kilos of nitrogen, there was minimal response to it. So again, we wanna be putting on at least 25. And we're getting this curve, the response rate dropping off once we're up around that 50 to 60 kilos of N. So we don't wanna be going over that because we're on that law of diminishing returns. Um, the third thing that comes into this particular graph is just um, uh, the, the different seasons. So you can see the response, response in late spring, and you can see the response in early spring, and you can see the response to applied nitrogen in winter. And so in this particular case, with this particular cultivar, uh, there was no winter response to applying nitrogen. And that's classic for things like the old, if you've got a Vic perennial ryegrass, um, so some very inactive winter growth uh, grasses, then putting nitrogen on isn't going to stimu stimulate any additional dry matter production. So it's really important to understand the cultivar that you've got in the system and the species you've got in the system and understand that if you are getting growth at those times of year, then putting nitrogen on will potentially give you some additional dry matter. Things like base um, will give base, you know, two will give you um, will give you great responses in the in the autumn and the winter compared to say the old Vic varieties. Um, so yeah, so that marginal economic return we've got to look at. Um, 
the seasonal, you know, whether it's autumn, winter, spring, uh, or summer, uh, understanding the, res the, the different responses and the growth patterns over those times, the cultivar of the variety, mineral nitrogen we spoke about, grazing management, moisture, and also the previous rotation. So what you find, as I said before, about that silage cut that might've occurred in the, uh, in the spring, and you've actually taken off a huge amount of nitrogen, none of that nitrogen has been returned from a grazing animal. So it's probably in a, in a very end deficient situation. In that situation, then potentially you may push these rates out a little bit higher over or at the top end of 50 to 60 kilos um, of nitrogen per hectare just to get that, uh, get that response to the subsequent growth because you've removed so much end from the system. So this is a, a trial that we did down in at Bioduct in the Western Districts in 2016. Uh, so no nitrogen here, uh, 30 kilos of nitrogen, 60 kilos of nitrogen, 90 kilos of nitrogen, and 120 kilos of nitrogen. This is an annual ryegrass uh, zoom uh, that was uh, autumn sown. And you can see the, uh, the, the size, I suppose, of the plan of the zero compared to the 120 kilo of then um, killers. To maximise dry matter response in... Uh, in ryegrass, you need to be sitting at about three and a half percent leaf N. Um, and that works out to be about 24% nitrogen, uh, sorry, 24% protein. And that's a bit of a quandary because your grazing animal has a requirement of about 16, 17% protein in its diet. So to get the maximum N response, you need to be above that level. Um, but uh, but that's, you know, you can just see, I suppose, that the response of the nitrogen as you're increasing the N rate. And just have a little bit of a look at that data. Again, these are the different cuts. So uh, we've got a, a cut on the 15th of June, cut on the 14th of July, 14th of August, 14th of September, 17th of October, and the 2nd of November. Uh, again, just have a look at the steepness of the curves, where the steepness of the curve is, that's giving you the greatest response. And, and, um, and so, you know, our 30 to 60, 25 to 60 kilos of end, you can see that we're um, getting not bad responses through most of those, um, those cuts. Uh, when we're looking at those higher rates of nitrogen, you can see that a few of these are starting to flatten out and plateau uh, a little bit. So the response or the economic response to those higher rates of nitrogen isn't occurring. And just to have a look at the, the data on how much dry matter was actually produced from this trial. So this is no nitrogen. It grew about three and a half thousand kilos. Just by putting 30 kilos of nitrogen into that system, every time we cut it, so that was over six cuts, six grazings, essentially. We grew an extra 3,000 kilos or close to 3,000 kilos of dry matter. Another 30, ki 30 kilos of nitrogen grew us another um, 2,000 kilos of dry matter. So we pretty much maxed out that response up to about 60 kilos of N, although at 90, we, we did get a statistical difference, but 30 to 60 was pretty much the sweet spot. Um, and that's what we've been saying. That's where we need to be, obviously. I just want to show you, this is, you know, our response. So kilograms of dry matter per kilogram of N. And what we want to be doing is we want to be getting that over 10. So if we're looking at getting uh, a response of 10 kilos of dry matter for every kilogram of nitrogen we're applying, then it stacks up reasonably well against other food sources or feed sources. So, you know, we can see when we're putting out these higher rates of nitrogen, uh, even though we're increasing our dry matter yield, uh, the response per kilogram of N starts to drop off. So this is a sweet spot, you know, in that 30 to 60 kilos of N range is, is what we want to be aiming for. And on this particular trial, it just is the, um, this is a daily growth rate or the average daily growth rate over that grazing. So you can see what the control did. That's what it, these are the daily growth rates during those periods of time. Uh, and if we put 30 kilos of N on, uh, even over the winter, we were growing Doubling our, uh, doubling our dry matter production in that winter cut. Um, so, you know, even though our responses were low, lower, um, we were still doubling the amount of feed. So that's the value proposition, I guess, on when the value of the feed is greatest, um, even though potentially the responses are going to be less. So yeah, that increased, um, you know, we, we increased these, uh, these daily growth rates quite significantly um, just by applying that nitrogen over the control on average. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, it all comes down to, so like I said before, the, the feed, 
you've got to, so when we're stocking, um, there's going to be periods of the year when we're going to be having to look at supplementary feeding. We're going to have to fill those feed gaps and we need an alternative feed source or we need to grow additional grass in the system to, to carry through that shortfall in feed. And so it comes down to the cost of those alternative feeds. Do you grow the grass with urea? Do you buy in hay or do you buy in grain? Uh, and they're the, they're the options, I suppose, that you can, uh, that are in front of you. And you've got to break it down to look at it. Um, you, you've got to break it down to a common denominator. And that common denominator is energy. So the value of the feed as an energy source is got to be compared. And so there's some calculations here and I can flick through a very basic uh, Excel spreadsheet that I've just used to pull this together. I can flick that through to Lisa and she can send it out where you can actually just plug in some numbers and it'll recalculate um, uh, the comparisons on how pasture stacks up against the cost of hay, how it stacks up against the, the um, energy of grain or the cost of grain. But I guess from a pasture perspective, if we just look at that and we're looking now at urea, you know, over a thousand dollars and, you know, potentially by the time you get it on the paddock, it might be a $1,700 a ton. Uh, you know, it's $148 a hectare investment. So, you know, if we're getting these um, five to one or seven to one responses, so kilograms of dry matter for every kilogram of nitrogen we're putting out, then, you know, it becomes quite expensive, the feed, the value of that, the cents per megajoule of meta metabolizable energy becomes very expensive. But if we can start getting these responses, you know, of eight to one, 10 to one, 20 to one, then the value of that feed or the cost of that um, energy starts to really shape up and, uh, and stack up quite well. Now I've used 12 and a half megajoules of metabolizable energy. That previous trial I showed you had a consistent 13 to 13.5 ME value on the feed test that we did on that. So uh, if your grazing management's right um, and you've, um, uh, and you're using nitrogen in the system, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, around that 12 ME. So, you know, really good quality feed. Um, and then you can compare it to the cost of hay. Uh, this is a value, so you can change the values, uh, the ME of the, of the hay. And all of a sudden, you know, if we're buying in hay at $300 a tonne and it's 10 or 11 ME, we're comparing that to about an eight to one response of nitrogen when we're paying $1,700 a tonne for the urea. If we're getting a better response, then it becomes cheaper than hay at that value. And if we look at grain, you know, grain at $400 a ton, um, 12 megs of energy, um, then it compares roughly with that eight to one response of nitrogen at this stage as well. Now this doesn't take into account utilization. Um, so there's, 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 uh, there's feed out costs and there's utilization um, costs if, you know, if the utilization of the pasture or the hay or the grain drops down. So you can put in some factors around that as well to adjust that up or down. But this is just purely looking at the, um, the overall cost and then work out the efficiencies of labor. And, you know, if you've, you, you know, going and feeding out in, in a lambing, in, into the lambing use becomes a bit, bit of a headache. So, um, you know, with, with, mis, with mis mothering and that sort of thing. So potentially using nitrogen to, to stimulate that pasture growth, put them into a paddock, let them lamb down on a, um, on, on plenty of pasture is, um, you know, a strategy that, that potentially could work. So I can flick that through and people can have a bit of a look and change the numbers around and see. But one of the things that we do know is that grain prices um, are going north, uh, 400 is probably a pretty good value at the moment. Um, you know, if you look at where we are internationally, probably we're going to be $500 a tonne for grain uh, next year if, uh, if prices uh, line up with the international prices. Um, and hay, given the value of nutrients in hay um, now, the cost of all the nutrients in the hay uh, and the demand on um, grain and also the demand coming through for hay, you'd expect these prices to increase as well. So it's all, you know, horses for courses. At the end of the day, um, the feed, the energy needs to come into the animal somewhere. Um, and it's just really lining up with, okay, understand all the fundamentals on what you can do to get the best response out of nitrogen, pick your best bets um, and use it in those situations. Understand all the factors that I spoke about uh, and then compare it up against some other alternatives. Um, but the main thing I suppose out of this slide is to really just consider um, being on top of understanding what 
feed demand you have got for the next six months because uh, it's no use being in another two months time and grain's gone up, you know, 50 or a hundred dollars a ton and hay scarce. And all of a sudden we're getting very minimal responses, you know, in the winter for, for nitrogen application, it's all too late. So you push yourself into a corner. So do some numbers, have a bit of a strategy. Um, don't throw nitrogen out of the bag out the, out the door at the moment because, um, because it still does stack up if you follow the, the rules. Lisa just, and I'll just finish off uh, on these last couple of slides, but um, Lisa did just throw in gibberellic acid. So I just wanted to talk, this is the Flaris trial that we did at Tadong in 2016. So it was quite a good year. Um, and, uh, and we threw gibberellic acid in there. So there's just a couple of things I just want to show from this trial. Um, so GA is harvested 28 days. So, you know, 28 days after you've applied gibberellic acid, you can come in and graze it. Um, once you let it go past that point, uh, you know, the, the, any benefit sort of gets diluted. What we found is that we didn't get a response to gibberellic acid compared to the control. So um, no N and no gibberellic acid. But we also didn't get a nitrogen response to 25 kilos of nitrogen or to 50 kilos of nitrogen. Um, and we didn't get a response to applying 25 kilos of N with ProGib either. So there was no response to the ProGib application with nitrogen. But we did get a response when we put 50 kilos of N um, out as urea. Uh, with the ProGib over the, the normal um, urea application at 28 days. But what we also did is we split these plots in half and, uh, and we looked at the total uh, dry matter that we could grow off these plots if we let them go through to 52 days, so the full leaf emergence of this Phalaris trial at that time of year. And, uh, and so what we got is a response up to around that 25 kilos of N really, I mean the 100 kilos of N um, no, so 25 kilos of N gave us the, um, the top response, but there was no difference in uh, ProGib or, um, or ProGib and urea um, at any of those two rates at 25 or 50 by the time it went through to the 52 days. But I suppose my point is on this is uh, it's all about grazing rotation and making sure that you get that last leaf emerge to maximise, to get that extra 50% of dry matter that I was talking about before. And so if we're going in at 28 days, are we cutting off our nose to spite our face if we're using nitrogen in the system? And just to highlight that, this is um, the 28 day growth. So this is how much we grew for 25 kilos and 50 kilos of, your, of nitrogen. Um, and then we measured the regrowth after that 28 days. So from 28 days to 52 days, we measured that amount of dry matter. And from the two cuts, we ended up with, with that much dry matter um, and compared to the control. For the, for the one cut that we let go to 52 days, we grew an extra 500 kilos for the 25 kilos of N. We grew an extra 900 kilos, say, for the 50 kilos of N. Um, and, you know, we also grew quite significant, uh, quite significantly uh, an extra couple of hundred kilos or 150 kilos over the control. So that was the increase that we've seen if we let that pasture go through to 52 days rather than having two grazings over that period of time. So I guess if we're looking at ProGib and we're looking at nitrogen, um, potentially it works okay. But just think about the grazing management and sometimes you know we need to go in and we're short of feed and we need to sacrifice a paddock and that that value of that that feed in the short term is more than the longer term but uh just consider i suppose when we're using nitrogen that benefit of that last leaf leaf and a half emerging how much extra dry matter you can grow to maximize that response to the nitrogen so just to summarize Understand your, um, understand your nitrogen cycle. Um, you know, there's plenty of loss pathways through that. And, um, uh, and, and there's, a, there's the best management practice as far as, you know, having soil moisture and all those sort of things. So um, just, just understand the nitrogen cycle, I suppose, it, it, and, and the losses to minimize, um, uh, minimize losses and maximize your response. Uh, understand your rates and your responses. So, you know, that 25 to 50 to 60 kilos of N, don't go over, don't go under, that's where you need to be. Um, have a good understanding of, you know, your species and cultivars. They're going to behave differently at different times of the years and give you different responses to that nitrogen. So if they are growing over the winter and you get good growth rates, then you're going to get a good return from that nitrogen application. Um, you know, your fertilizer, understand your base fertility, your swore density and your composition. So pick your winners, make sure that you have those all ticked off before you go and throw expensive nitrogen on it, onto those pastures. 
Um, get your grazing management right. There's there's big gains to be had if you can um, if you can set your pastures up right and get really good responses to that applied end. Remember, uh, it doesn't carry forward to the next grazing that that residual nitrogen. It it will be lost so or tied up. So um, use it in that grazing rotation or lose it. And the other one is just moisture. You know, don't be like uh, this bloke over here. He's uh, you know, he hasn't got enough moisture basically, and he's not going to get a good response to the nitrogen. So you need to have moisture in the system to get that that value out of that nitrogen, and just be proactive, think ahead, understand when your feed gaps are going to be, do the sums around uh, alternative feed sources, um, and and you know there will be a compromise or or, or a combination of hay, silage, grain, um, and also nitrogen, but um, you know that there are big benefits in still um in still using n in pasture situations so that's it lisa from me